continue this evening in our series in John's Gospel. And as you'll see from the reading, we're in John chapter 20. Now, last time we looked at the crucifixion and we saw that Jesus Christ truly died. We thought of the wonder of the fact that here we have men acting according to their own thoughts and ways, their own sinful inclinations, yet God is fulfilling his plan and fulfilling scripture. None of his bones were broken. A wonderful fulfillment of the Psalms. Uh, his side was pierced. A wonderful fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah. God is fulfilling his word. And yet it's clear here that the Lord Jesus Christ truly died. Uh, the evidence is that we have confounds those who claim otherwise. And it shows us, therefore, that Christ truly rose from the dead. And yet, as we thought last time, there's a deeper significance to that death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ was separated from this world by his death. And Paul says that we too have been separated from the world by the death of Christ. And so, therefore, we are to live to the world. We've been separated spiritually from the world as Christ was separated physically. And we are to live not to the world, we are to live to God. We're to live to God. We've been separated from this world. Do we live separated lives? Lives which are separated from the world? That was Christ's desire, that we should live lives that are separate from the world. Of course, we're not talking about joining a commune, going off and sort of having a physical separation between us and the world, though sometimes spiritual separation will involve a physical separation. There'll be places we can't go, things that we cannot do. But are we those who seek to avoid the world's attitudes, avoid the world's ways, which do not please God? Their concern is number one, looking after number one. Our concern should be to put God first, to put the Lord first. That's our great privilege, to live for him, to live for God. Surely that should be our response when we think of all that Christ has done for us. Well, now we have the resurrection, John's account of the resurrection. Now, John goes into great detail here in his account. We get things from John that we don't get from some of the other gospel writers, like the incident with Thomas. I'd like us to look at this. We're going to have a bit of an overview tonight of what John says, and also really an overview of the resurrection itself. But I'd like us to focus in the end on the way that the disciples responded to the resurrection of Christ. And our title tonight is this, Spiritual Responses. Spiritual Responses. We're going to have three points. We're going to look, firstly, at Christ's resurrection. Secondly, how it was received. And then thirdly, different spiritual responses. Different spiritual responses. Well, firstly, Christ's resurrection. Now imagine, if you will, that there's an accident outside the church here. And not something we wish, of course, but uh, several things occur. A lorry hits a car, and it then hits another car, and it ends up knocking over a lamppost. And we find that as we ask different witnesses about what happened, they were all truly there, we wonder if they've seen the same thing. We realise they did, yet they saw it from different viewpoints, from different angles, different perspectives. Each didn't catch everything that took place, yet from their witness, from their testimony, we can piece together everything that occurred. It takes some hard work to piece it all together, but it can be done. But the very fact, you see, that they are independent of each other adds to the integrity of the count that we eventually have in our hands. And so it is with the resurrection. If we try and piece it together at first, it's not easy how it all fits together. However, it does actually fit together. It takes some work, but it can be clearly shown how what may seem contradictory at first all does actually piece together. And again, the independency of the testimony that we have underlines the genuineness of the account. It's clearly not been concocted. 
You know, the resurrection is the very foundation of our faith. And if it's not genuine, then all that we believe is meaningless, worthless. We had that reading from 1 Corinthians 15, and Paul goes on in later verses to say, well, our preaching is in vain. Our witness is in vain. And you are still in your sins if Christ is not raised from the dead. It is a keystone of our salvation. And so really, there are only three explanations with regard to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not that complicated, actually. There's only three explanations. The first is, well, the disciples took the body. That's why the tomb was empty. The disciples took the body. But we know that that cannot be so because there was such a guard on the tomb. It's only after the earthquake and the angels descended that the guards, guards fled. And so the people go into the tomb. But there was a strong guard. The guards were warned that their lives would be forfeit if they did not guard the tomb. So there's no way the disciples could have come and taken the body. The only other explanation is the authorities had the body. The authorities took it, but again, that cannot be true. Because we know that at any time, if they wish to silence the preaching of the apostles, as they often wish to do, they could have just produced the body. They preached of the resurrection. They could have just said, well, here we are. Here's the lie. Here's the uh, fact that gives the lie to that. Here's the body of Christ. They could never produce the body. The disciples didn't have it. The authorities didn't have it. The only explanation is this. Christ rose from the dead. That's why the body wasn't in the tomb. But what actually happened? What actually happened on that third day, on that Sunday morning? Well, here's an overview. There was an earthquake. The guards are shocked, become like dead men. Eventually they flee. The angel descends, rolls away the stone. Then the woman... Uh, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, they go to anoint the body. And they're thinking, well, who will remove the stone as they approach? They arrive and they see that it's already rolled away. The tomb is empty, they're perplexed. Mary Magdalene runs off to tell Peter and John. The other women stay and two angels appear and speak to them and announce the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we read there in the Gospel of John. And he gives them a message for the disciples. As they leave, or as we saw, they actually meet Christ in the tomb. But as they leave, uh, they meet uh, Jesus. And he gives them the same message for the apostles. They go and tell the disciples who don't believe. They don't believe at first. Meanwhile, Peter and John return. They reach the tomb. John doesn't go in at first. Peter arrives second, but typically of Peter, he goes straight in. And uh, John then goes in and he sees the grave clothes. And John sees the grave clothes and he is convinced in the way that they are folded, he can see that they could not have been, that the body had just been unwrapped and taken. The grave clothes have just sort of collapsed. They're still perfectly as they were when they're on the body of Christ. It can only be that the body is pass through the grave clothes. He starts to appreciate the significance of this. There's a first understanding, stirrings of understanding and of faith. Peter and John leave. Mary Magdalene arrives again. There she, she's weeping. She sees the angels. She too is given a message for the, the disciples. She takes it to them. And then we're told in the scriptures that Christ is seen by Peter. He's seen on the road to Emmaus. He's seen by the apostles. He's seen by 500 brethren at once and by James and by lastly, uh, lastly, he's seen by Paul. Now, someone has said the accounts by their very nature show that they're not concocted. You see, many have seen things when they've wanted to see them or thought that they should be seeing them. Apparently, people saw zeppelins. During the First World War, people saw zeppelins. I don't know if you know what a zeppelin is, but it's one of these great big airships. They saw them over central London when no zeppelins actually came over central London. They were mainly in the home counties, but people were looking for them. They were looking for them, and so they thought they saw them. These disciples and the women, they weren't looking for the resurrection. 
It wasn't in their minds. They were slow to believe. It's clear it wasn't just sort of frenzy. It wasn't just their imagination. It wasn't just an hallucination. How can 11 or 500 people have the same hallucination at once? Also, if somebody was concocting this account, they would never have written it in the way that it is, with the unbelief, the uncertainty, the fact that they're slow to believe. You wouldn't have wanted to have included that if you're trying to convince people that something was true that wasn't true. And also, I'm afraid, the fact that the first to discover are women, again, that's something you would not have wished to have necessarily had in your account, because in those days, women's testimony was less credible. And yet the first witnesses that God chose to reveal it to was these women. All these things show us that the account is real and true. There are many other things. The tremendous change in the disciples eventually, when they know the resurrection power of Christ at work in their lives. The spread of the gospel, taking out this message, how it spread, how it had great influence. They were saying, these men have turned the world upside down by this message of the risen Christ. Christ truly rose from the dead, and every true Christian knows that it's so because of the work that God has done in their hearts. But secondly, how this truth was received, how it was received. Well, in many ways here, the women put the men to shame. They have a zeal, they have a concern for Christ's body, they're showing a love to Christ. They haven't fully thought out how they're going to get the stone removed. But still, there's this concern, this zeal to do something for the Lord. Some have a zeal without knowledge. Others have knowledge, but they've got no zeal. They see the angels. There's not a word of rebuke from the angels, but a message. What great news. The women are given it first to give to the men. Mary Magdalene has this most moving experience with the Lord Jesus Christ, perhaps acknowledging her love. Her love was very deep. She'd had seven demons cast out of her. He who is forgiven much, loves much. No word of rebuke, yet she's favoured. She sees Christ for herself. What a wonderful thing that is that was given to her. These women, you see, they had an appreciation of Christ, perhaps a deeper appreciation than many of the men. They saw with the eyes of love Mary anointing the Lord Jesus Christ before his uh, death, very much favoured by him. And of the men, well, John runs faster than Peter. We saw that. He goes so far, he stops, he peers in, but he doesn't go in. He's looking around, he's thoughtful, he's taking things in, that which he'll later show to us in his gospel. Eventually he has a deeper understanding and insight. He can work out what's going on from the way the grave clothes are laid. Peter arrives later, but he gets in front, goes in before John. It doesn't have the same impact on Peter as it had on John. However, generally, you see, the disciples' response is poor. We're told that initially they didn't believe. They thought that the words of the women seemed like idle talk. And we know that when they're on the road to Emmaus, the two disciples, they're still sad. They still hasn't, the penny hasn't dropped. They say certain women astonished us by telling us he had risen. Christ rebukes them, how slow of heart and slow to believe. He appears to the eleven, he rebukes them all. That word rebuke is a strong word. It's one which means they should have believed from what they'd been given. Then he enters into, his, into their presence, enters into their very presence. He shows them his hands. He shows them his side. But really, Thomas is the one who shows the greatest unbelief. He wanted absolute proof. Christ humbles him before all. Has to come to him and personally humble him, showing him his hands and his side, and yet eventually he gives that wonderful declaration himself. 
He says, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. So we see these very different reactions, very different responses to the same event. We see some with faith, some with unbelief, some with zeal, some with apathy, some with understanding, some with a lack of understanding. Very different spiritual responses to what is taking place here with the resurrection. And so that's our third point, different spiritual responses. As we see different spiritual responses here to what has taken place from these various ones, we can see different responses even today in those who receive the truth. And we can think firstly of the response that is made to the truth that God reveals in the gospel, in the message of salvation. So really there are only two groups in this world, two fundamental groups of people. Those who know Christ and those who don't. Because you see there's only two roads. We are either walking day by day on the broad road that leads to destruction or we are walking on the narrow road that leads to life. You, whoever you are here tonight, you are walking one of those roads. You're either one who's entered by the narrow gate or you're still on that broad road that goes by the way of the broad gate. You're either a sheep or you're a goat, one of Christ's sheep or not one of his sheep, or you know Christ or you don't know Christ. All here tonight, every one of us is on one of those roads. And you know, Christ could take us. He could take us tonight and he could divide us up perfectly. He would know which road we are on. Nothing is hidden from the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, one day he will. One day he will. He will take the whole of mankind and he will divide us all up here. Divide the whole race up into those who know him and those who do not. What is your response to the gospel? What is your response to the truth of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? Can you say tonight, I know that I'm his. Were he to come tonight, though I am unworthy, I know I'm unworthy, I do not deserve it, I would be with him. And I would be with his people because I know him as my Lord and my Saviour. I have submitted myself to him. I've seen that I cannot save myself. I've seen that I need to be saved. And I have humbled myself and submitted myself to him. And if he doesn't save me, nothing else will. There is all my trust. There is all my hope. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say that tonight? Is that your experience? You've truly come to know the Lord. As I say tonight, you're, you're not in a third group. I'm afraid you cannot sit on the fence. There's no fence to sit on. We're either one who knows the Lord or one who doesn't. We're either on the broad road that leads to destruction or the narrow road that leads to life. And yet the Saviour, the risen Saviour, calls us even tonight by the gospel, by his word, and says, come to me. Come to me and know my salvation. Come and humble yourself and trust in me and submit yourself to me. And know what it is then to know life, salvation, peace with God, and to walk with me on that narrow road that leads to life. Yet as we see here in this resurrection account, even among Christians, I believe that these ones here were truly saved, yet there's great differences in their responses. If we look at Christians, we find some know more than others. 
Perhaps some may be better read, better taught. Some have a greater understanding. Some have a greater zeal. Some have a greater devotion. Some have a greater love. Some have greater faith. There's a great variety in the Bible. We can look in the Bible, can't we? We see all sorts of different characters, different strengths, different weaknesses. Abraham, Lot, David and Solomon, Daniel, Samson. In the parables, we find there's a variety there. The wheat on the good ground, some bore 30, some bore 60, some bore 100. Different churches in Revelation, different needs there amongst those churches. What a variety there is. Think of those with Christ. Some were given much and there was little response. Others were given little and there was much response. Think of Bartimaeus. Think of the woman who touched Christ's clothing. Think of the centurion whose servant was healed. Tremendous response to the little that they had. Tremendous faith and trust even with the little that they had. You see, it's not just the knowledge that we have. It's not just the light that we're given. It's what we do with the light that we're given. It's how we respond to the light that God gives us and the knowledge that God gives us. The disciples, sadly, their response here, for many, especially amongst the men, was poor. They should have known. They should have done better. Christ says they were slow to believe. Now, it's very important that we know the word of God, that we know doctrine. We can't build a house without bricks. But we don't just want doctrines for doctrine's sake. We don't just want an empty shell. We want that house lived in. There should be life. There should be a response to God's truth. There should be fruit. And you see, the Bible is like a mirror. We're told that in James, aren't we? It's like a mirror. And we can look into it, into the Bible and... We're meant to look into it and say, well, we see things there, we see people there, and we say, well, who am I like? Perhaps we find we're like various different people. Perhaps we sometimes say, Lord, I'm Job. Lord, I'm Solomon. Lord, I'm Peter. Help me, Lord. I can be just like them. But who are we? It's vital that we know ourselves, isn't it? Vital we examine our hearts. What is our response to the things of God? Think of the zeal of the women, born of love, love for their saviour. they do anything for him, even go to that tomb so early, risking the rejection and even the hostility of the soldiers willing to go because they loved him so much. Are we willing to do anything for the Lord? Anything the Lord asks? They obviously needed guidance, but yet Christ he encourages them, doesn't he, with his words. They're very commendable to him, these women, in their attitude. Some can have great zeal. Perhaps they can be impractical at times. Others, they're more thoughtful, but they can perhaps not do anything. All the differences that we've got. We've got Peter here. He's impetuous. He wants to be in front. He'll do it. John's more thoughtful, thinking things through, seeking to understand what God is saying through these things. The disciples at first, it's as if nothing has happened. They remain in the upper room. They're, they're afraid. There's no real exercise of faith. It seems that with the men disciples, especially a bit of sort of sleeping gas has come over them spiritually at this time. Not even aware of the scriptures, which clearly teach of the resurrection of Christ. If we're honest, where do we come? Where do we come in these spiritual responses? Think of this, Christ is risen. Here in John 20, Christ is risen, yet his disciples didn't grasp it. He'd overcome, and yet they didn't understand it. Sometimes it's how we can be, isn't it? If we're honest with ourselves. We can be lethargic, unbelieving, lacking faith, lacking zeal. But Christ is risen. He's risen from the dead. He's overcome the world. He's overcome the devil. All power and victory is his. Do we believe that? Do we really believe it? 
If we do, then surely there'll be an exercise, there'll be a concern, a zeal for the Lord, a longing to see his hand, to see answers for prayer. If Christ is risen, he's with us, he's in our hearts, he hears us. Surely we want to be those who see the Lord working, showing his resurrection power in our own hearts and lives. We'll be willing to pray, to labour, to look to him in faith. We'll desire even a greater experience of him and of his love in our hearts. To know more of the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder where are you spiritually? What's your response to the Lord like? The Lord sees. The Lord knows. Do you show a love? Do you show a zeal for the Lord Jesus? A concern for him? Or is your concern very much taken up with natural things? With the things of this world and the desire for spiritual things, it's not really so much there. How can we assess ourselves? Well, we can think about the resurrection as we thought. The resurrection, Christ is risen. How can we take that and apply it to our lives and benefit from it and prosper from it? By looking to him by faith, desiring all the more to know his grace, to know his power, to know his help, to know his comfort, to know his strength in our lives. But what about the return of Christ? What about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? It's going to happen. It's going to, to happen and it's getting very near, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. How does that affect us? Are we ready? It could happen at any moment, couldn't it? The Lord could very quickly fulfill all his purposes in a matter of hours, if he so wished, and come very quickly. How much do you want the Lord Jesus to come? For the Lord Jesus Christ to come again? How much do you want it? You, can you say, yes, even so, Lord Jesus, come? Even so, Lord Jesus, come? Or do we say, no, not yet, not yet. I've got so much else that I want to do, so much else that I want to experience in life. We all know what it is to have our desire for this vary as believers. Perhaps we all feel it's not all that we would want it to be. Longing for the Lord to come. But you see, if we're a Christian here, we should desire that. We should aim increasingly to have that desire that the Lord should come. Because you see, for the child of God, there can be nothing more wonderful ultimately than to be brought into the presence of the Lord. No experience on this earth, nothing we can yet do, no place we can go, no holiday we can have, no love we can know, no relationship we can know, nothing we can be given will ever compare to what it means to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus, in whose presence is fullness of joy, and so, you see, if we have a closeness to the Lord, we'll have an increasing desire that he might come. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And this will go hand in hand with a desire, a zeal for him and for his glory. If we're close, we want to see his resurrection power all the more at work in our lives, strengthening us and giving us help and giving us victory. Christ is risen. Do you believe that? Do you know that? Christ is coming again. Do you believe that? Do you know that? Well, if we do, may the Lord help us to seek him, that our spiritual responses might be increasingly what they should be, that we might all the more have zeal for him, have faith in him, have spiritual attitudes, have spiritual concerns, May we all respond as we should to the risen Christ and to all that he has done. Let us remember, he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think, how he can work in us if we will but look to him. And those who know their God shall be strong and carry out exploits. May we know our God and therefore be strong in the battle, strong in this life, knowing the risen Christ, blessing us, helping us, us overcoming by faith, making the right spiritual responses until that day when we're called to glory, 
or until that day when he comes again and we are brought into his most marvellous presence forevermore. Amen.